You're listening to the Gutsy Podcast, where we talk about all things real, raw, and ridiculous about running a business authentically. Whether you need an inspirational pick me up or a swift kick in the mental ass, the Gutsy Podcast is your bi weekly guide to getting out of your head and back into action. I'm Laura Ora, branding and mindset coach for female entrepreneurs. CEO of Works & Co., and your host on this journey through entrepreneurship. It's time to fuel your gutsy. You've heard the saying, when you follow your happiness, money follows. But where does that journey begin? Self-love is a deeply rooted phrase that has a very different meaning to each of us. And as an entrepreneur, It requires an even deeper dedication. Today, we're talking about the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful entrepreneurial journey with self-love with the most amazing Dr. Katie Jane and how this self-love journey can actually shift your life and your finances. Named one of the top 75 yogis who are shifting the planet by Origin Magazine, Dr. Katie Jane is a Sanskrit and Vedic scholar and skilled Vedic astrologer who traveled India interviewing saints and yogis for her doctoral research. This woman is incredible. She divides her time between the United States and India, where she leads spiritual retreats to the holy Himalayas. I can't wait to get into this. Dr. Katie Jane, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Gutsy Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited and for everybody is listening. I think we're all soul sisters here. I could not agree with you more. <laughs> we were just talking before we started recording about, you know, just the power of connection. And yeah. um, when you put yourself out there and you just really step into that space of who you are, how you become a magnet to the other people that are very similar to you. So true. So true. So I always love to talk about the backstory because I think the entrepreneurial journey is just fascinating. So you were a college professor <laughs> then turned astrological counselor. So tell me a little bit about what that journey looked like for you. Well, I I grew up um, with a single mom who showed me how to be an entrepreneur because her back was against the wall a lot. And I think that's what entrepreneurs are. They're people who, you know, when they when the, when their back is against the wall, they come out fighting. And so I had that modeled to me by my mom. It's amazing. And it's probably listening right now. Um, and then I, I got really, really fascinated with India as a child. I, um, I learned about Gandhi actually at the age of eight in church. I went to a very liberal church and our minister was a civil rights activist. And he talked a lot about Gandhi. And I was so impressed because I had grown up with parents who were war refugees And I just, I thought it was so amazing that a country could win its independence through nonviolent means, through not firing a single bullet. So I got really fascinated with India and that fueled my lifelong love of India. Um, For the past 30 years, I've been going back and forth for my studies. Um, And now I'm married to an Indian and we run a yoga retreat center in the Himalayas called Dunagiri Retreat. But in any case, that was that was a bit about, you know, my passion for India. But then after I completed my doctorate, I found the professor life, sorry for any professors out there, not really for me. I, I found the salary horrific and I, I just wanted to do something more. I wanted to do something gutsy. And very appropriate here. <laughs> and, and yet my background was in religious studies and Sanskrit and yoga. And I just thought, you know, this, the only thing you can do with this, this knowledge is to teach. And then I met my ex-husband who is an entrepreneur and had a, grew up in a family business and so on. And so he really encouraged me and said, you know, you can turn your knowledge into profits and that I took that idea and I just ran with it and started creating way back before online courses were a thing. I started creating online Sanskrit courses and Vedic astrology. I started getting into applying my knowledge in a way that I thought could really help and guide people. 
So that's a little bit about my leap. I mean, there's a lot more to it, but sure, we don't have a thousand hours. <laughs> yeah, I know that we all have our our own novel inside of our hearts. You know, when we talk about that that initial leap, which is yeah. which is terrifying. What was what were some of the things that were like pulling at you or 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 coming through your head or coming through your soul that was like it's time because I think that's one of the things that entrepreneurs struggle with the most is knowing when it's time and then how to connect that with your body yeah well I mean okay so I I was very very lucky I went to graduate school in paradise I went to UC Santa Barbara and I was there for 13 years and it was amazing. The, the university, the Department of Religious Studies there is incredible. The professors, students, everything. And then when I finished, my first job as a professor was at a very small um, Methodist college in a tiny town in Iowa. And I had never been to the Midwest. I grew up in Massachusetts and went to school in California and had never been there. And, and it was it was really a wonderful experience overall, but I hated it. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. So I just was like, there's got to be something else I can do with my education. There's got to be um, an application for this. And at the same time, yoga, this was in the year 2000, yoga was just taking off in the United States. I mean, yoga teacher trainings were cropping up everywhere. And suddenly, people wanted to learn Sanskrit, and they wanted to learn more about the philosophy that that um, is at the basis of their practice, the authentic roots. So I suddenly had a business. And I think that should be encouraging for anybody who has a very unusual passion that and, and I'm quoting, I think, Marie Forleo, and I don't know if she quotes this from somebody else. But the definition of an entrepreneur is when your greatest passion meets your client's greatest need. Mm. And that was my opportunity. I was like, wow, suddenly yoga is a thing. All the things that I've been interested in the last 15 years of my life, suddenly now it's meet the mainstream. Well, I always think it's interesting, too, like, especially when, you know, if, you know, it, definitely in your case, but I know in a lot of other cases as well, like if you're the trailblazer, meaning you were doing it before it was cool, <laughs> so to speak, um, you know, that definitely takes a lot of gutsy to kind of be the spearhead and be the front. And like, you know, I just envisioned the, these powerful women walking through a jungle, just like, you know, slashing down, uh, you know, all the, uh, the overgrown to create this path for other women to walk. And it just, it takes one or two people to start that ripple effect. And then all of a sudden it's, it's mainstream. It's right. common. It's, it's in every home. Right. So, you know, if you're, if you're in a case or in a situation where you're like, I don't, I don't know if anybody understands even what I do, I can promise you at some point, it's going to be a thing. Yeah. <laughs> so you might as well run with it while it's, while it's hot in your life, for sure. You yeah. also went through kind of some, some challenges and some turmoil. Mm -hmm. You had to rebuild your entire company after your divorce. Are you willing to, to tell us a little bit about that journey and what that, what that was like for you? Yes, I, I am. And, and I was thinking about this because I was prepared for our conversation. And like, what can I talk about? Because, you know, I didn't want to I don't want to tell too much of the doom and gloom, but it's so interesting when you go through something tragic like a divorce or death or, or big ending, um, it's so lonely. Nobody ever asks you when you're in that time, in that place, hey, what, what's going on with your journey? It's only after when you've succeeded and you've gotten over it that you can say, oh, yeah, you know, I went through this big, dark time. <laughs> um, but, but so so I found it kind of ironic that now it's a thing, now I can talk about it. But And I am very happy to talk about it. So, yeah, I went through a, a really awful divorce. I mean, I don't think anybody says I went through a great divorce. But it was bad because my husband and I were business partners. And my, my ex-husband ran all of the tech. I mean, he did all of the background stuff, all of the... Um, 
uh, online work, and I just created the content, just created the content, but still, <laughs> right, <laughs> like that. And and yeah, we had kind of a, a yucky divorce, and and as a result, I ended up um, having to recreate everything from scratch, including all the tech. Well, first it began with the marketing list. I, I didn't, because of the yuckiness of our divorce, I didn't have that. So I had to rebuild it from memory and contact my people. I mean, and, and this is when I, I had no money either. And just be like, hey, I'm here. I'm offering service, you know, and, and that's how it began. But I had to learn things like making videos and editing videos. I had to learn even before that how to make my own website. I created a website from scratch from Wix. And I mean... It was, it was really, really tough because I thought that I couldn't do it. I thought I was a tech dummy, that I was just challenged in any kind of practical area of life. And so I had to really get over that. I had to realize, no, I can do it. I mean, it, it, like Marie Forleo, who was such a hero for me at that time, she said, everything's figure outable. And it is. That's such a good reminder because I think that the tech portion of business yeah. is often the thing that scares people more yes. than doing the thing that you came to do in the first place, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Like teaching people, creating content, that came pretty naturally to you, I would assume. But the tech portion, it doesn't come so naturally. So we automatically put up this barrier like, well, I don't know how to do it. So therefore I can't. Right. That's but you just figured it out. Like <laughs> you just literally just figured it out one step at a time. And, and here you are. Yes. The same thing about money too. I mean, it's these three things for me were a big challenge. Of course, the tech um, marketing and um, money. I just thought, Oh, numbers. I can't do numbers. I can't figure out money. And that's why I ended up in the situation I was in. I realized, and this is just such a weird thing, and I think women who wake up realize what we do, and they're like, oh my God, look at our mind. But I, I of course, bought into this idea that there's some man out there who's going to save me and take care of me and take care of all that worldly stuff, financial stuff, so I could be the yogi that I always wanted to be. And, and I realized... It, at the end of my marriage that I was working, I was the one who was making all the money at the end of our marriage. And I was giving all of that control to my ex-husband and then asking him for an allowance. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, wake up to that girl. And, and that's why I was in the situation I was in. He had control of the money. He could just cut me right off. And he did. So I was... I, I really had a harsh lesson in, in um, you know, waking up from that delusion. Well, and I think you brought up a good point, too, is about the money and as a creative female. I think sometimes, and I know I went through this, and I had a hard and fast, like, reality wake up. I'm like, I'm a free creative. I'm not a numbers person. That's very black and white. It's very mathematical. It's like the other side of my brain. Like, I don't know. I feel like I existed the first decade of my business operating in that mentality. And it ultimately backed me in a horrendous corner. And then one day I woke up and I was like, um, I need to become a numbers girl. <laughs> I need to take my own power back in my own finances because if I don't understand it, how on earth am I ever going to achieve the financial goals that I have in life? So, so I can completely relate with you. <laughs> I got it. So true because it's power. You know, all of these things are power. The power to be able to um, figure something out, the power to be able to communicate effectively to people, marketing and money. I mean, it's, and, and I realized in all of these areas that I just had such a fear of my own power. Mm, oh, yeah. oh, tell me about that. Tell me about that realization. Yeah, because then maybe I won't be desirable in a relationship, right? If I'm too powerful, then I'm, you know, it, I, I had, it's so weird because I grew up with this feminist. I grew up with this single mother. But I realized I had such an old-fashioned 
notion about what a woman was and what a wife was and and um and that I had to really overcome and you know and that's where the self-love piece comes in love and Um, power connected that is a true story so I am really intrigued to hear about and learn about what an astrological counselor is, because I think that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, it's just, I, I, I think it's, it, it answers, astrology is powerful, and especially Vedic astrology, the modality that I practice, is so powerful because it answers the fundamental questions that all of us have which is who am I and why am I here? And so much of our our suffering, our emotional suffering, our physical financial suffering comes from being uh, in the dark about that. And I feel that astrology can really shorten the therapeutic time. And I don't want to discount therapy. I think therapy is extremely valuable. But in terms of knowing those two important things, when you know that, then you can work on all the ways that you have um, strayed against your own authentic center. But this is what I do in my work. I helped validate what people are in their highest light or who they are in their highest light that was imprinted at birth in them. And that's, that also is really fascinating. That's something that, you know, if you're a hardcore scientist, you might have a hard time accepting, but, but when you see it over and over again, we really are imprinted beings and we really have a particular life calling Mine happened to be something strange with religious studies, but but if I align with it, which I did, I mean, even though it's so bizarre, I was able to carve out a really wonderful life for myself by aligning with who I am and taking actions. So that's what I that's what I do in a nutshell with my Vedic astrological counseling practice. Mm. So what are some what are some things that our listeners could start to tap into or lean into or you know really kind of embrace to start learning on their own like what their life's path is or what their life's calling is because I know that can seem like a big question but I guess my question is how do they know when they start to get into alignment or how can they be on the lookout for that Right. So, I mean, there's two ways I can answer that. I mean, if people are interested in Vedic astrology specifically, I have all kinds of free courses that they can take to learn about that, that model. Um, and, but, but, but more tangibly, how do you know when you're in alignment with your purpose or your destiny? Things start working out. I mean, I, when I started off in my life, uh, when I first started going to college, I wanted to study law. And yet every door leading to law was closed to me. It just wasn't going to work. I mean, yes, there is a certain point where you have to break down the door if you really want it. But there was just nothing that was aligning with me. And yet everything toward India and yoga and religious studies was like a revolving door to me. I really think that our path in life is meant to be effortless. That's not to say it doesn't have challenges or difficulties, but there's a, there's a flow that's available to every single person. And when you tap into it, you know that you're in the flow because you, you realize, oh, wow, like I was just thinking of that person and they called me or... Um, all of a sudden some opportunity comes and it's completely in alignment with what I really wanted. So I think those are really powerful signs. How do you know when, or what guidance do you have on how to know when to break down that door and fight for what you want or to know when it's time to walk by it and towards the revolving door? Because I think that that can be somewhat confusing sometimes. It's like, how do I, you know, that door's not opening, but 
you know, should I fight harder for it and, and push it down? Or am I trying to fight for something that doesn't belong for me? Well, I really believe in what the Buddhists call upaya, which means skill in means. You know, sometimes breaking down the door may not be the wisest choice for you. I, what, I, what I love about understanding who we are and why we're here is that you understand what works best for you. What is your core power? What is your best means of persuasion? All that kind of skill in means we can apply. And mostly, though, we know in our gut, we know inside what it is that we really want. If we're breaking down the door because we're doing it um, to please or to fulfill somebody else's expectation so that we feel successful in their eyes, then, yeah, no, don't break down the door, please. But, but to tune in and listen to what you know, and I see this so much in my clients, they know what they want. They know what they're here for. They just need to be validated for it. And then, yeah, do whatever is within your particular skill set to get around that obstacle. That's, that's your life lesson. Mm. usually the obstacle is the same one. It keeps coming around again and again and again. So you have lots of chances to learn. That is so true, man. It shows up in different, in different forms and different colors, but yes. that, that thing likes to show back up. You know, I just wrote a post recently about trusting your intuition and, you know, whether you feel it in your head or your heart or in your gut. Yes. oftentimes like we already know the answer right like our body intuitively knows the answer but our ego gets in the way totally totally what are some what are some things or suggestions that you have around like balancing the ego versus the intuition because i feel like that's where the internal struggle where a lot of people really fight with them with themselves mm-hmm. yes well there's there's something that i teach my um astrology students and that is a, a Greek word. It's called epoche. Epoche means to suspend judgment. And it's really important when you're doing intuitional work uh, to recognize the difference between intuition and ego. And of course, the astrologers do this all the time. They impose their own vision of reality on you and make it seem like it's what you are supposed to do and be. And, and that is a complete misuse of this knowledge. You have to really cultivate this separation. And this is through suspension of judgment, not eternally. I mean, we can't always be in a state of suspended judgment, but that's that sense of suspension of judgment to be able to look clearly. And I was, I was, I, I was observing this in my my sister recently. She's in a she's in a tough situation where she has to fire an employee, and she was sharing about it with my mother on the phone, and asking her advice and whatnot and sharing. And as I was listening to her, I was like, "Wow! Like the trouble that you're having with her, because I know my sister so well, is exactly the trouble that you have with yourself." But you can see it because you're so caught up in, in um, uh, you know, um, villainizing this person, which is what the ego does. You, it's your fault. You are wrong. This is what's wrong with the world. This is what the trouble, this outward constant projection, rather than taking a moment to suspend judgment and see, okay, what is this teaching me about me? Maybe this person has come into my life to create such a problem because they're educating me about something that I can't see. And they just have to come as this, this nuance, nuisance, nuisance. So, so that's what I feel about um, making that distinction between intuition and ego and how important it is. And of course, women, we, we have this, we have access to this. Sometimes I think women need more ego. <laughs> yes, I, could, I would agree with that. <laughs> um, you know, we're so quick to, to empathize. And I mean, one of, the, one of the New Year's resolutions, which I've already broken a million times already, is to not constantly preface everything I say with, I'm sorry. Mm, yes. 
Yeah, I uh, my friends love me because, or anyone that's close to me, because you know they'll start the conversation with, "Oh, I'm so sorry," and I'll immediately stop them. I'm like, "Why are you sorry?" Yes. It's like breaking that habit. It, I mean, we're, it's we're just so ingrained to say, "I'm sorry." Yeah. I'm sorry for bumping into you. I'm sorry for being late. I'm sorry for not getting back to you sooner. I'm sorry. It's like, yeah, it, it's not necessary, but it's a, it's a, it's a habit that needs to be broken, but it has to be broken from within. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, For sure. Yeah. I think that that pause of that self reflective moment of like, what am I learning mm-hmm. really also helps to like diffuse the heightened emotion that's often around decisions like you know whether it's a decision or a cir- circumstance or a situ- you know whatever it is is going on it's so easy to get emotionally wrapped up in it and then you start thinking you know in all different directions but when you can take that self-reflective moment and say okay what am I learning from this mm-hmm. what do I need from this how is this actually helping me to expand mm-hmm. it takes that heightened emotion and like simmers everything down (laughs) but that I mean that's inner strength right like that's that's a practice it's not just like oh I wake up one day and now all of a sudden I'm reflective like it 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 shows up in the weirdest of ways it requires I mean I it really requires I think a discipline this epoche the suspension of judgment this listening to the intuition it really requires I think a daily practice of meditation I, I couldn't live without meditation. I think it's so, so, so important because it gives me this moment twice a day or at least once a day I try to silence my mind. It's not an effort of silencing the mind, by the way, but just giving myself the space just to ah, let it go and just be without any agenda. And, and that I find carries throughout my day. I can, I can tap into that because I practice it, because it's familiar to my mind. My mind, when it encounters stress, it realizes, oh, okay, wait a minute. You, can, you have a deeper place you can, you can sink into and evaluate the situation. Of course, I mean, I'm painting it like I do that all the time, <laughs> and I do not. But at least I know. I mean, the difference is that I know it's there, even when I'm upset. So I can the the time of upsetness may be shorter. I think that we could all use a little extra love around the meditation topic because I think a lot of people have really good intentions. Yes. Speak. I'm raising my hand. You can't see me, but I'm raising my hand. <laughs> we have really good intentions, but it's like, well, if the setting isn't right, or I, you know, I have a million thoughts going through my head, so I'm not doing it right, or I'm not doing it long enough, or all these things. But meditation is not necessarily like sitting cross-legged with your mind silenced for an hour, no. right? There, yeah, no. What are different forms of meditation, or like, you know, just in general life, what are ways that people could meditate? You know, I, I love the classical ballet of meditation, which is Vipassana. And of course, Vipassana can be very, very intense. I mean, you can do these 10-day Vipassana retreats. But I love just setting the timer for 12 minutes. This is the beginning Vipassana 101. Set your timer for 12 minutes and just sit wherever you are. You can sit cross-legged if that's your thing, but you can sit anywhere and close the eyes and just watch your breath. Just breathe. There's nothing that will calm down your mind more. Close the eyes, watch the breath. When it starts, you start to get distracted, like, oh my God, I got to make dinner. And it's, uh, this is going on. The, the timer's going on. Uh, just come back to the breath. Come back to the breath. And 12 minutes, I mean, if you look at your phone, which I've been looking at lately, lately screen time. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. An hour and a half of screen time per day or something I'm averaging. I mean, that's ridiculous on my phone. Doing what? Looking at stupid stuff. Looking, at, you know, Googling. And, and I mean, 12 minutes I can sit and watch my breath. And that's called shamatha. That's called quieting down. And we have to we have to love ourselves enough to value that mental hygiene. I mean, it's to me, it's mental hygiene to just take that time. I mean, I wash my face, I brush my teeth, I floss my teeth, 
why don't I take care of my mind and my emotions in the same way? You know, I think that's such a common, gosh, it's such a common um, challenge, right? Like you, you said it perfectly. You wash your face every day. You know, you go to the bathroom every day. You, you know, you shower some people every day, some people every other day, whatever your routine is, you make your coffee every morning. We have so many of these other like kind of ingrained routines, but the mental health aspect is like, oh, that, that's a special thing. Why? Yeah, that's only when Why you have you a shakedown. That's only when it becomes a problem. <laughs> only when shit hits the fan that you're like, okay, maybe I need to go meditate. <laughs> totally. But that's part of the self-love journey, right? Totally. Is learning what your body and your mind needs. Totally. And well, and the thing about meditation is compared to all those other things that you mentioned, including making coffee it gets associated with something unpleasant. It gets associated with, oh, I have to sit. And, and when, we, when we face our minds, we, we see all the crap that we've kept in there, all the false beliefs, all the insecurities, everything. So it's unpleasant. We don't like it. So to make it pleasant, I think the breath is so enjoyable. When we can learn to enjoy our breath, then it won't be a then it won't be a chore. It's like, oh my God, I just love to be able to sit for 12 minutes, especially mothers. Oh my God. Look at your life. You're running 12 minutes rest a day. It's and we ha- and we do have 12 minutes. I know that we are all like, oh, I don't have time. Well, yeah. you you had a case in point, like close the book, put it on the shelf, such you know, scenario that you mentioned, which is Mm-hmm. Look at the screen time on your phone. Yeah. Alone. Like What's that? we tell ourselves what we want to believe sometimes yeah. and not having time is just an excuse for not yeah. putting back into yourself. Yeah. It's more honest to say, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, true. That's true. That is so true. Um, you know, I always find, you know, again, as a creative how when I do give myself, like I have found, I love to just sit in the window. Mm-hmm. The warm sun comes in, it's quiet, you know, like when everything is still. And even if I only sit there for five minutes, yes. there's something about that. It's almost like an energetic reset. And I find that if I'm having a creative block or I'm stuck in something, if I just give myself those few minutes, yes. the creative downloads start like coming faster than I can even get them down. Yes. Yes, we, we have to value the art of letting go. And I've noticed this in terms of sales and profits, too, that when I'm, when I'm glued to my computer, like, okay, why isn't anybody signing up? Why isn't anybody signing up? And I just say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go meditate or I'm going to go take a beautiful walk in nature. I'm going to go for a drive. I'm going to shift gears. I'm going to let go. And inevitably, that's when the sales come in that's when things mm. we have to get out of our own way it's it's not an option i think the same goes for social media this is something i've been recently doing is shifting from like after something goes you know a- after i post something instead of sitting there waiting to see like who's going to respond or how many likes it gets or does it get saved or shares or not you know all these things it posts and i Go do something else. And then later on, I'll check and I'm like, oh, shit, look at that. (laughs) You know what I mean? It it takes you out of this um, reactive mode and this hustle mode, this very masculine energy, and it puts you back into that that flow mode. Totally. Yeah. I mean, social media is just such a, ah, it's a mind. Bittersweet. It is bittersweet. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really, it's just, yeah. I mean, it's bittersweet. We need it. We need to communicate. But, but people get so, and myself included, we get so personally attached to what people say. And it can really disturb your peace. It can. And so, you know, on topic here with self-love, it's yeah. coming back to remember what is true. What is actual, you know, if I always think it's, it's interesting because a lot of times we associate our success online with how many likes or follows or actions that are taken. But I think that there's a a perspective with the self-love aspect to know that 
you have no idea how many people are secretly watching you that are that are your future buyers, that are your future partners, that are, you know, going to offer you a deal down the road. You know what I mean? There's just, there's so much in silence that we don't, with, that we forget exists. And we put all of the weight into what's happening right now. Yes. Yes. It's so, it's so true. And, and there is, there is, um, I think a law, maybe it's a law of physics, but every effort has a consequence and you may just not see when it when it arises. I mean, it may not arise immediately. I, re- I should say rather. So th- this is the law of karma. You get what you put out. So if you put out all this effort and it doesn't immediately show up, it will eventually. I mean, I've had so many experiences where even recently somebody said, "Oh wow, I read an article that you wrote in Elephant Journal back in 2004, and I've been following you ever since." Mm. I mean, isn't that magical? (laughs) Only now, 16 years later, I decided to have a reading with you or a study with you or whatever. It's amazing. Wow. Yeah. See, that's, there's a a real life scenario. You just never know who's watching or who, you know, who you're inspiring. And I think that's kind of part of the bigger discussion as well is why are you doing this? Yeah. Is it for the bigger picture? Is it to inspire and to guide and, and to teach and to improve the lives of others? Or is it to get likes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, or yeah, or any of those fleeting things. And and if you base yourself on those, then your your mind becomes a yo-yo and your I just value inner peace more than anything else. I just think it's the, the highest prize we can go for. You know, I think that's actually one of the the bittersweet things that came from, you know, when we were, when we were shut down in the pandemic in 2020 Mm -hmm. is that we were all kind of forced to hear ourselves. And I think that's where a lot of the discomfort came from. That's my own opinion, but I think that's where a lot of the collective disruption came from was from within ourselves because we couldn't be going, we couldn't be busy. We couldn't be fulfilling all these other things. And like, we couldn't be actively avoiding the shit on the inside. Mm-hmm. And so it caused, it forced people to do that. But I, I think that's one of the beautiful things that's moved forward is a lot of people realize like where, where they're willing to tolerate and not <laughs> where they're willing to sacrifice their time and not, you know, we just, we collectively gained a lot of value. Yes. And, but I also think that all this time with our minds, has created a huge mental health catastrophe and that there's there's such a need now. I mean, I, I, I'm in this field, so I've been following the trends and, and with yoga. And up until the pandemic, I think that the real issue with people was about bodily stress. I mean, driving your kids back and forth to school and balancing all that with your work and your family life and your your health and your self-care. And I mean, people were go, go, going before. And then all of a sudden we're confined at home and the body is less of a problem except for the 15 pounds. (laughs) (laughs) Except for all that damn snacking. (laughs) And all the sourdough bread baking and everything. Um, But, but what has become more apparent, I think, and, and a really big need in people is managing their mind and their mental stress. Look at the stress we're under collectively. Mm -hmm. It's just so intense. And, 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 and there are people that have never even thought about their, their mental health or their emotional health. It hasn't been emphasized. So I think that there's a really big need in the world for, for healers big time right now. Yeah. I, I was just having that conversation with a friend the other day. I said, I don't think that we understand yet the long-term effects mentally of this. Like this is a rip, this is a ripple effect. And like you said, there's a call for healers and you know, and the, self, I, the self-love train is, is, is getting going. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's so, it, it, it's so true. And, and I used to mock that I have to admit um, until I went through my divorce and my, my dear friend, Doug 
said to me, we're having a Louise Hay study circle every Thursday um, and you have to come to it. And I was like, oh God, because I'm a scholar. I thought Louise Hay was really lightweight. And, and, but I was desperate. So I went and, and the first exercise was look in the mirror and tell yourself, I love you. And I just thought that was just so like hokey. But like I said, I was desperate. My life had come to a complete zero. And so I thought, what well, can't hurt me? And as I started to do that, and I started to see the benefits of it, I realized, oh my God, this is not hokey at all. This is essential. Without this, you can't even, you can't even back out of the driveway. Yeah, it's, uh, gosh, it's such power, right? You know, it's, we talk a lot about taking your power back here on the Gutsy Podcast, and I think that self-love is, is such an important piece of that, and whether that's loving and accepting your body for the way that it is, or taking care of yourself mentally, or, you know, meditating, or working out, or whatever it is that fuels your awesome. Yeah. It's needed and it's welcomed and it's necessary. You know, it's not selfish by any means. It's necessary. It's necessary. I know. And yet women, at least I know me and and many of my friends, we're just so conditioned to to equate self-love with how much we love somebody else. Mm. I love you so much. So that should equal something back to me. Right. (laughs) I, I mean, that was my big learning. When, from my first marriage is that no no it can't just be only about giving 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 love to the other person you got to put something in your own account literally what about yeah, literally <laughs> yes what about you know you talked about when you follow your happiness that money follows and how all of that is kind of energetically aligned tell me a little bit about that relation and you know what we can talk to entrepreneurs about, you know, how important that is. Yes. And, and I, and I've seen this in, in many of the lives of my clients who call me for the, for for the big issues. When am I going to meet my soulmate? Uh, What's, what's the right career for me? Can I leave? How can I leave my job? All this kind of stuff. And, and what I find at the basis of that is fear fear that I can't have what I want by following my authentic calling that I feel so deep inside, but, but I've been talked out of, or I've been conditioned out of. And, and all, all I can say, and I think this is where we need guides. We need um, healers. We need helpers, therapists, counseling astrologers, podcasts like this, um, even even great brand managers um, to help us make that leap, to make that, to, to have that faith. I, I have a client who, she, she had a career her whole life as an accountant. She grew up in a very conservative Japanese family and her parents wanted her to have a practical career, even though her whole life from childhood, she just knew she was an artist. She had such a passion for art. And when it came time for college, she wanted to go to art school and her parents were completely against it. And so she became an accountant and she was an accountant for 30 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. And she made money. See, here's the thing about money. It, it's not necessarily that if you do something against what you feel that you won't make money, she did really well. It was the quality of the money and what it brought her in her life, which was unhappiness every day going to work. So the money wasn't really what was at the basis of, of, of her, her contentment. So anyway, I, when I met her, I saw her chart and I said, oh my God, you're an artist. Why, why aren't you working as a professional artist, even you could really, you can, this is a possibility for you. And she started crying. She said, I've always wanted that my whole life. And, and, but, but she was willing to make that step and she quit her job. She was near retirement anyway. So it was a safe leap, but she quit her job and she started painting 
And she started showing her paintings in galleries and started making money. She's, oh actually, she's actually she's actually sustaining herself now in retirement as as a well paid, very well paid fine artist. And I just think that's such a great story because it's something that that we're talked out of. Oh, you could never make a living as an artist. Well, maybe not everybody, but she could. So we we have and we all know what that thing is we just need the validation that yes you can you can actually do that and and assembling the team of practical people who can help you realize your dream um in in the world i mean like you said creatives we don't know about all this stuff like how to market how to brand how to how to put things together we have to learn that and it's important. It doesn't distract from your creativity one bit. Just makes it possible for you to be sustained in what you love to do. Gosh, that's such a power. Thank you for sharing that. That is a real powerhouse story. <laughs> um, you know, and it, I think it's so funny because an accountant and an artist are literal opposite sides of the brain. So, I, I could literally feel her relief in my body <laughs> in that turning point in her life and I can just see her doing I don't know I just see her just doing what she was always called to do and being insanely happy yeah. and also hey by the way being really well paid like that's, that's what you were talking about earlier when we first started talking it's like it's effortless when you are in line with your soul's purpose with your with your life's mission like the the literal reason you were put on this earth yeah. when you're in alignment with that things just Almost sometimes you're like, are you sure? Because this almost seems like, is this real? <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's just really, it's a, it's a cool feeling. Because we've been talked out of it our whole life from the time we were shut, the long time we were little kids. Oh, well, everybody would like to have that, but you can't. Or, or other people can do it, but you can't. I mean, there's so many ways that we're projected upon uh, from from such a precognitive age that by the time we're adults, we just are so conditioned. And this is also why I love Vedic astrology is because it really helps you to see the difference between how you're conditioned and who you authentically are. Uh. And I think that we need reflected to us, given given how far away we we are led from our authentic center. I think it's really important to know too that like seeking validation is not always bad because like in her case, in the artist's case, she came to you. And I think as, you know, light workers, as guides, as healers, yeah. there are people put in your life and in your path to help you along the way. So I think there's a big difference between seeking validation to like, hey, make me feel better yeah. or I see like like what the work that you do almost like these milestones or checkpoints along somebody's journey to, to remind them in, that they are going in the right direction. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong at all in seeking validation, especially when we don't get it from oftentimes from the people who are closest to us in our life, ironically. So it's really, I, I just think it's, it's just, essential especially when you're in a very low esteem moment through some ending through a divorce or a death or you know, loss of job or any of the difficulties that we're all facing in this world right now mm -hmm. or even like that fork in the road right you know we all inevitably end up at that at that that sign where we need to you know go left or right and yeah. which way to go which way do I go? You know, it can get, that's where ego comes into play. And that, you know, ego has a lot of words to say, <laughs> yeah. but not always the ones that you need. That's right. Or should I take that direction because it will make everybody else happy with me? That's also ego. Mm -hmm. I think it's ego. We think it's, it. you know, anti-ego can also be ego. Oh, interesting. <laughs> I know. It's funny. But that's, that's the slippery slope of the ego or the, the sly devil that he is. 
is that sometimes we think, oh, I, I just surrendered my ego. I don't want anything for myself. It's all about the other. And that also becomes a, a problem. It also, it's actually just as big as, as a narcissistic kind of ego expression. I think healthy ego, that yes, you, you deserve this. You can do it. You have the abilities. I mean, that's all healthy ego. And we need that in order to, to do gutsy things, bold moves. Very true. As we start to round out our beautiful, beautiful conversation, what are some tips or suggestions that you have for the female entrepreneurs that are listening about the self-love journey? Well, I think, as I said before, the, the, the best place to start is knowing who you are and why you came here. And And once you know that, then everything becomes a lot easier. I mean, not like there aren't challenges, but it becomes easier because you can always default to that. Oh, is this aligned with who I am and why I came here? No? Okay, I'm not going to waste my time with that. So I've created a lot of um, free resources for people to answer that question with Vedic astrology. So to, to learn more about it, you can check out my website risingstarastrology.com i have my um like i said complimentary webinars that can teach you about how to read your chart and the value of the chart and all that kind of stuff introductions to the system and you can also check out my website drkatiejane.com and i have my blog and other resources there courses and all kinds of stuff fantastic yeah guys make sure you check out Katie stuff. She's, as you can tell, a powerhouse, but in the most like beautiful and loving of ways. <laughs> I, I just think that even just talking to you is just very soothing. So, um, and one of my one of my last, but maybe one of my favorite questions is: I'm curious what gutsy means to you. Oh wow! You know, and and I have done lots of gutsy things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a whole other conversation, the gutsy moves that um, a lot of people stood on the sidelines kind of biting their nails. Um, I, I mean, to, to paraphrase or, or to borrow, plagiarize Nike, just do it. Just do it. And, and I, I feel that, that that impetus to just do do it. Like you quit your job. I mean, that must've been so hard being pregnant and, and, oh my God, I'm going to be a mother. And now I'm letting go of my job, but you just did it. And look at what happened. You've created an incredible business and, and you're free and you can, you can decide your fate. So I, I mean, fear is false evidence appearing real. That's just the bottom line. That's the acronym. And when you realize that, then you can just push the paper tiger away and go for it. And everything that you see and feel on the inside is on the other side of that. It's on the other side of one decision that leads to another scenario that leads to the next thing that, you know, it's uh, like a really awesome box of Legos that you get to build. Yes. And I find that so fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Katie, Katie, thank you. Thank you so much for spending your time and your knowledge and your expertise with us today. I just find you absolutely fascinating and beautiful. And thank you for the work that you do. Oh, thanks so much. It's been so wonderful to be on the Gutsy Podcast and connect with your listeners. Just a wonderful time. Thanks so much. Mm, It's my absolute pleasure. Be sure to join me this Thursday as I invite you to take your power back by evaluating and rewriting yourself worth. Oh, we're going to just dig into, dig directly into the depths of your self-worth and start putting some action behind it so we can get you closer to your vision. In the meantime, head over to lauraora.com where you can sign up for the Powerback course or schedule your personal one-on-one Powerback session with me. Get social with me online using at that Laura Aura. And as always, until I see you next time, stay gutsy. Mm-hmm.